Do you know Australia? You think you might, but you don't know this place. Several hundred metres behind me, past this sun blighted scrub, trees and some brackish water, is a place that few people know about, and even fewer discuss. It's called the Swan Island Training Area, and though it's only 90 minutes south of Melbourne, it's home to one of the country's best kept secrets. It's a top secret counter-terrorism training ground and, in the last few years, it's been home to the men and women fighting Australia's quiet war. In 1964, the Special Air Service of the Australian Army was given regimental status and became the centre of the young country's special forces. Over the next four decades, the SAS kept a broadly uniform makeup. Three sabre, or fighting, squadrons, as well as some support staff. Then in 2005, in the aftermath of the Al-Qaeda attacks of September 11, the SAS raised another sabre squadron and called it, simply, Four Squadron. If you want to deal with the Al-Qaeda's of this world, you've got to have first class uh, operational and strategic intelligence. We learnt that from the failures to uh, anticipate 911. But despite the intervening seven years, it's only today that its existence is being revealed. That's because during that time, Four Squadron has undertaken some of the most clandestine and classified operations Australia has ever been involved in. Operations that exist in a murky world where the line between civilian spy and military soldier is becoming increasingly blurred. You don't need the military to do uh, all of this other intelligence stuff if you've got your uh, intelligence agencies operating effectively. Um, it's blurring uh, the, the, the legal uh, boundaries, it's blurring the accountability boundaries, and I think Australians would rightly ask questions as to why on earth our military forces are, are going about uh, performing regular intelligence gathering functions uh, which exposes them to danger uh, and puts Australia in a very difficult position uh, in relation to other states if our forces are captured. There's always the risk of overreach and the, the possibility for, of disaster, whether it's people being killed because of lack of poor planning or, or, or just because it's a difficult and dangerous business. Yes, the risk is always there. And the more you do these things, of course, the greater the risk that something's going to go wrong. On the other hand, what you do, if you're a, a, the minister or the prime minister or the government of the day and you've, you've decided that you need vital intelligence that's not available by other means, you're going to have to do these kinds of things. Four Squadron's main role is long-range intelligence gathering, often deep in enemy territory, with small teams of intelligence officers from Australia's secret service, ACES. Most of those operations have been conducted in Afghanistan and Iraq, some as joint missions with US Special Operations Forces and the CIA. But since at least last year, Four Squadron has been carrying out an even more dangerous role in an even more uncertain part of the world. What the Australian public have not known until today, what Fairfax has been able to confirm, is that soldiers from the SAS's Four Squadron have been operating on their own in a part of the world where Australia is not at war, Africa. But before that chapter can be told, so you yourself can decide whether this new role is appropriate or beyond the pale, the story must focus on a small hotel in downtown Melbourne. It was after a botched and uncomfortably public training exercise in 1983 here at what was then Melbourne's Sheraton Hotel that ACES had their guns taken away from them. 20 years later, in 2003, the Howard government suddenly announced that the spies were getting their guns back. The reason the Howard government made that decision was if ACES intelligence officers were to operate in concert with special forces and travel to the world's most dangerous places, they needed to be armed, if only for self-defence. But there was also a reason that for 20 years ACES had been denied the right to carry weapons. The Sheraton event back in the uh, 1983 was unfortunate for a number of reasons. One is it was an attempt by uh, ACES 
and the military to put together an embryonic or prototype capability that we have today, but without either side really understanding what they were doing and having the skills to implement it. They hadn't told the management they were going to do it. They hadn't done, told the police they were going to do it. Yet they were running around the hotel with silent submachine guns, which they'd not even signed out from the Swan Island Training Area Armoury, and they were going to you know, snatch this guy from this hotel room. And they broke down the hotel door with a sledgehammer, all the rest of it. But they got caught more or less by the hotel staff, including the manager, and they brandished guns and got out. But they were incredibly lucky that the Victoria Police was on the way and they could have been shot. And it would be pretty hard to argue about the police shooting them because here are people waving submachine guns around and masks and so forth. The incident at the Sheraton left a terrible taste in the mouths of Bob Hawke's new government. And soon after, the agency lost the right to use weapons or violence. But the spies were determined to create a capacity to blend their intelligence gathering talents with military tactics. If they were ever to get such a capacity back, its heart would be found 90 minutes south of Melbourne, at Swan Island. Though the island has long been a training ground for some of Australia's most secret operations, it wasn't until after 2001 that it became home to Australia's counter-terrorism effort. It was at the height of the Cold War in the late 1950s when ACES took the site over from the Navy. For the next four decades, it was used as a proving ground for the agency's intelligence officers and for the military's special forces. Then came the Al-Qaeda attacks of 2001 and suddenly the site became the location for some of Australia's most clandestine counter-terrorism exercises. With this expanded role came a new building program, and today there are dozens of new buildings, many of them on the site's northern corner. If the Swan Island building boom was highly classified, what it represented was even more so. Since the middle of the 2000s, parts of Swan Island were used to help train the men and women of ACES and the SAS who became part of this new civilian military capability. And in order to command them, Australia's Special Operations Command, known as SOCOM, also increased its footprint on the island. Documents available on the Australian government's tender website reveal that Defence alone has paid private contractors more than $26 million as part of that building regime. And everything was in order to foster an increasingly symbiotic relationship between Australia's spies and its soldiers. We were all blindsided by what happened by 911. No one anticipated it. We found that we didn't have the right structures, we didn't have the right skill sets from our intelligence people. For example, we didn't have enough Arabic speaking people. Uh, certainly, you couldn't deploy most of your intelligence officers into difficult and dangerous environments. That's not what they were trained for. So what do you do about that? Well, the answer is you do two things. You work more closely with the Special Air Services, in Australia's case, and you reskill your civilian intelligence officers so they can operate effectively in joint teams and in difficult, dangerous environments, but there have to be limits around that and boundaries around that. It was in Iraq and Afghanistan that ISIS and 4 Squadron cut their teeth. From tracking elements of Abu Musab al-Zakawi's group, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to gleaning intelligence from insurgent sources in Afghanistan, the small teams worked hard, but completely off the radar even more so when they engaged in joint operations with the tip of America's Special Warfare Spear, the Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC. The United States' close military allies, of, of which Australia is certainly one, have um, seen uh, you know, firsthand the uh, success that JSOC uh, is having, at least at the tactical and operational levels. JSOC is more than just a collection of door kickers, you know, of, of super commandos. It, it also has um, an extraordinarily robust uh, intelligence uh, sort of apparatus uh, nested inside of it. The Australian militaries probably looked at that model and thought, how can we, uh, if not replicate, that at, at least create something like that so that we have um, more complementary uh, organizations to our core special mission units. 
I think it's likely that it's an attempt to emulate, emulate the United States. Whether it's a good idea depends on whether you think what the United States has been doing is a good idea. I'm not really in a position to judge that. I just wouldn't take it for granted that just because the United States has been doing it, it's necessarily a good idea or necessarily a good idea for Australia. I think you'd need to ask very searching questions about whether or not this particular form of intelligence collection capability is really a cost-effective way uh, of, of achieving the intelligence objectives you're setting yourself. And when I say cost-effective, I don't mean just cost-effective in terms of the dollars, but the risks and the, and, the, and the opportunity cost of distracting these valuable assets from other functions. While it remains unclear exactly what prompted the decision of the Australian government and its military, what is certain is that from at least as early as last year, four squadrons started going on operations without the presence of ASIS intelligence officers. Most remarkably, perhaps most legally concerning, is the fact that they are now operating in African countries such as Nigeria, Kenya and Zimbabwe. All places where Australia is not at war and where we have no declared military presence. If Australian forces are present in other countries uh, in circumstances where Australia is not fighting lawfully in an armed conflict uh, but they're just picked up as spies uh, on the ground, uh, that then exposes them to the full force and penalty of uh, the, the local domestic law. Now in many countries espionage uh, is an incredibly serious political offence which can carry the death penalty. Terrorism has morphed in many ways including and spread geographically so Al-Qaeda affiliates are now most active in the Horn of Africa and those affiliates are either directly or indirectly targeting Australian interests. So I think the decision has been made if we ever go to these places again we really want to have the best possible intelligence we have so we know what we're getting into and I think there, those are the factors that are driving this newfound intelligence interest in the Horn of Africa and Africa more broadly. It appears that even some of Four Squadron's troopers have become frustrated that while they are doing the job of a spy, they're being exposed to far greater risk because they're denied the legal cover such civilian intelligence operators receive. Simply, they feel they are vulnerable because the legal world is not caught up with their newly evolved role. While they are convinced of the justness of their mission, they have foreseen the very real dangers they face in undertaking it. Committing forces to military operations is not just another day in the office for a government. It's a very serious step to take. I think for a government to do that without informing the Australian public, at least in very broad terms, is, is a very serious step. Now again, I can, I can perhaps imagine some very special, very extreme circumstances under which a government could responsibly decide that it had no option. I'm far from persuaded that the war on terror has so far provided that kind of occasion. I mean, don't believe that just because we're a democracy somehow we'll do the right thing. Uh, we know that security agencies, particularly when they operate in the dark, have a tendency to overstep uh, the legal powers they're given uh, and if you don't have the right kinds of uh, scrutiny in place, the right kinds of accountability mechanisms, then those dangers are, 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 are all the more real. There's no doubt that there are legal shadows cast by these soldiers. But as their work in dangerous corners of the globe is increasingly showing, that has not inhibited their masters. As the international community continues its gradual drawdown of major combat troops in Afghanistan, they will increasingly be replaced by special forces. As the curtain closes on the world's latest round of large-scale land wars, it will continue to open on this new and ultra-secret shadow war.